friends, in Jesus' name, it's time for our Wednesday night Bible class. And these sessions, as many of you know, some of you may not, are coming to you through the facilities of the Midwest Center for Truth here just out of Leslie, Arkansas, up in the Ozark Mountains of Northwest Arkansas. And these sessions are all a ministry of CMI Bible Research Center, which is located here on the campus, and they are a production of CMI Audio Video Network System being brought to you just now over Ustream on your internet provider and YouTube. So we just welcome you wherever you may be found tonight uh, into this class period and we welcome all of you who are with us on a regular basis as well. Uh, you who are with us regularly know that what we're looking at in this Wednesday night class is the, the subject of the feasts of the Lord in Israel. That's the subject. The object is Christ himself, the fulfillment of these feasts uh, is Christ himself. And that's what we've been looking at. Uh, we were interested in and, and gave some consideration to the, the Passover, uh, uh, which has to do very specifically with the person of Christ. Passover is his death. And the Passover is his burial. And the Passover is his resurrection. But there are these other feasts. And it's in these other feasts that we find ourselves being made the believer, being made partaker with Christ in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, as far as that goes, in his ascension, and in his glorification. Because the church, which is his body, is the very vessel, the very vessel created of God in Christ Jesus for the reality that is fulfilled in Christ himself. When did all of this, when did all of this involve the church? When did Passover, in the historical sense and certainly in the ever ongoing spiritual sense, when did Passover become a reality to the believer. That was at Pentecost. Now, on the little chart behind me, it's just a very simple diagram, but I, I have just listed uh, on the one side of this, of this blackboard, uh, Passover, and on the other side, tabernacles because that's how they were spread out uh, in time, in history, uh, in Israel. But here in Christ, the significance of each of these feasts is gathered together in him. And it's done so in the coming of the fullness of time, which we're going to be looking at in just a minute. But the reality of this is Everything that is represented in Passover is gathered into Christ. And everything that is represented in tabernacles is gathered into Christ. And it's gathered into Christ in the Feast of Pentecost. Because it is the Feast of Pentecost that unites Christ and the believer. It is the fulfillment of Pentecost in Christ, that fulfillment 
And we've been talking about that. The fulfillment of Pentecost is Christ dwelling in the believer. By that, the church was born. The church came into being. The church was created. And everything of the feasts of Israel were gathered in to Christ at that time. You have to understand that you cannot maintain these feasts in a series of weeks or a series of months or in a year. At one time, that was the timing that God gave to Israel when he spoke to them of, of Passover. And that was while they were still in Egypt. He told Moses, this is the beginning of months for you. And what is being said there, this is the beginning of the year. This is the beginning of time. This is the beginning of time for you. You will no longer measure by the time of the Egyptians. You will no longer measure by the time of the heathen that is around you. This will be to you the beginning. And who was speaking to them? Well, the I am that I am was speaking to them and the I am that I am is fulfilled and revealed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself who says I am the beginning and I am the ending. And that, if you can hear this, I mean I know that he is just the beginning period. The beginning of what? The beginning. The ending of what? The ending. The beginning and the ending. It's not talking about a starting and then a cessation. It's talking about who he himself is. The beginning and the end. The alpha, the omega. You, you can't put that into years. But God was giving these feasts to Israel. They were the feast of the Lord. And he was giving them giving these feasts to Israel as a type and a shadow of that which would come to be fulfilled in Christ. And so it, is, it was very much about time. This is the beginning. Oh, hon, I, we dealt with this in Passover, so I can't go back over it again. But for you and I who come to Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, that is the beginning of time for us. The beginning of a new time that is without days, weeks, or months. The beginning of a new time that is the day of the Lord and has no night in it. The beginning of a new creation which is not numbered in calendar years but is eternity itself that was all fulfilled in Christ he is he is the resurrection he is the life he is the day he is, you understand but through Pentecost he is in you now this was our last lesson the I am dwelling in in you. The I am dwelling in his body. And we, we, we dealt with that in our, in our last lessons. And I'm in a way continuing that uh, today. But, but what we're looking today is that everything was gathered into Pentecost because, because Christ gathered Pentecost into himself he is the life-giving spirit. We read in Joel, we read in Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. And that meant in God's sight, there wasn't going to be another one because the day of Pentecost became Christ himself. He became the day. And with the coming of Christ came the spirit of truth, the spirit of fullness, 
the very spirit and reality of our salvation, he came on that day. Therefore, he took that day, just like he had already taken Passover out, out of the calendar. Now, the Jews went on having their Passover. God had already had his. Right here where he came to embody his church, the Jews were still having their Passover, their Pentecost, and God had his. Someone asked me, well, where do we see that tabernacles is fulfilled? Tabernacles is fulfilled in Christ, and it is fulfilled there on the day of Pentecost. You can't keep trying to understand these feasts, numbering them by days. Everything that tabernacle speaks of is fulfilled in Christ, and on Pentecost, Christ came into his church. Now, he is the fulfillment, he is the fulfillment of all of the feasts that spoke of him. And, and, and we'll look at tabernacles because it has a glorious it speaks of a glorious reality of Christ in you and you in Christ. It speaks of a glorious reality. It's like the revelation of the one that is in you, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the sounding of the trumpets and, 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 and the high priest going that one time in the year behind the veil and, and, and the ingathering of the of the final crop in Israel and, and, the, and the last Sabbath, the eighth Sabbath. We'll look at all of that in Israel, which Bible scholars say in that eighth Sabbath is the summing up of all the Sabbaths of all the feasts. Yes, that's true. Well, it is the revealing of Jesus Christ himself. It is the understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But... All of that comes to be gathered up in Christ and made manifest on the day of Pentecost. And I want to look at that with you. Uh, I want you to turn with me to, to Ephesians. Ephesians. We're talking about the gathering up of all things into Christ. And the all things of the Bible all relate to the feast anyway. Because as, I, as we've said in past lessons, honey, everything in Israel in one way or another related to the feasts. And the feasts to both the tabernacle and the temple The times of Israel all related to the feast. And we're going to read that about the fullness of the times in just a second. So the all things gathered up into Christ are the things that are set forth in type and shadow of him in Israel primarily coming to, to their focus point uh, in the feasts. Gathering up all of the days and the times gathering up the appointed place and the appointed time, the moed, gathering up in Christ the whole testimony of Israel is fulfilled in gathering into Christ the fulfillment that is in all of these feasts. So the all things. So we're talking about the gathering of all things into Christ. And by that I mean showing Christ to be the all in all. You ever thought about that verse? We're going to read it in a moment. Showing Christ to be the all in all. And I would like to consider that uh, from the standpoint of Christ being in you and you in Christ because that's what we did the last time, the I am, 
the I am dwelling in you. So I'd like to look at this all in all and just say it this way. The all the all who is in all who are in him. The all the whole of our salvation the substance of every type and shadow but more specifically of the feasts the all the one in whom it is pleased God that all fullness should dwell the whole of the matter the substance he is the substance that Adam never had he is the seed that Abraham never really had he is the son the son of which Moses and Israel were a type and shadow he is the all he is the view of God from the beginning to the end can't be cessation here the beginning and the end he is the view of God who is the beginning of God's view, the completion, the goal, the perfectness of God's view, the completeness of God's view, the whole. Can you get a hold of this? All of these feasts are testimonies of him. None of them were in and of themselves whole or complete. None of them. It took all three major feasts, gathering into themselves the seven feasts, but three major feasts, and none of them could in and of themselves fulfill completeness of salvation. Each of them spoke of him who is the completement of salvation. And yet it pleased God that that took place not only historically and more than historically because immediately that the Spirit came and filled all the room where they were dwelling or the filled all who were dwelling in the room because the Spirit didn't fill the room but fell all of them was there immediately it is out from history Israel's going right on with history Israel's going right on after that they had a feast of tabernacles after that right on you understand Jesus attended those feasts during that three years they were still having them but after the day of Pentecost in God's mind that's all over with. That is all over with. The allness has come. The spirit of truth who will make real the feasts of tabernacles has come. And he is now in his church. Well, then looking at all things gathered into Christ, I, I'm just saying, I would like for us to, it, it comes to me that the all himself, who is in all, who are in him. Christ all, and Christ in all, who are in him. Ephesians, the first chapter. When I was thinking about this, the gathering up into Christ, because it is gathering into himself that makes it real in his people. 
the church which is his body except he fulfilled and gathered these feasts into himself then it would still just be points on a calendar it'd still just be religious rituals like they are with the Jews until this day in fact they've added several to the list why not the list means little or nothing to them anyway as far as reality goes they're still looking for a Messiah that has already come and indwells his true Israel indwells his true body and in him all who are Israel honey are saved all Israel well who is Israel Israel is my son ha <laughs> ha even my firstborn yes all Israel shall be saved he is the salvation of the Lord and Israel was given as a type and shadow and God did choose that people as a type and shadow he did put his testimony in them though they were continually disobedient to it right up until the coming of the person of that testimony whom they would not receive God didn't reject natural Israel or the Jews personally the door of salvation is open to all he didn't even reject them as a nation because he was angry and mad and wanted to do something bad to them come on they simply ceased to have a purpose for existing and when they cease to have a purpose for existing God ceased to honor and to work with their existing and as a kingdom they were destroyed and the temple and the city and the sacrifices and everything else and though there are still Jews today and there's a nation of Israel today which I have a great opinion for a high opinion of but it has nothing to do with the salvation of the Lord that's fulfilled in Christ and these feasts that the Jews continue to have and the ones they've added to it are all fulfilled in Christ. They are now meaningless rituals. Meaningless rituals. But in Christ, oh my, they are absolute, complete realities. What happened at Pentecost in this gathering together? Let's look at it. Ephesians. Paul takes this whole thing back beyond even Israel under Moses or Israel under, uh, you know, coming out from Abraham's natural seed that was a type of a spiritual seed. Yes, yes, it was. Paul takes this back before the foundation of the world. He takes it back before the creation of the world, before the creation of man. He takes it back and look what he says. According, well, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Actually, it should just be in the heavens, separating it from anything in or on the earth. In Christ. In Christ. Everything, hon, that God created on earth, He did in a type, a shadow, and a testimony of the reality that He saw, determined in Christ 
before any of those things that would be a testimony of that reality were even created. So it is safe to say that God saw the fulfillment in Christ of all of these feasts in all of their meaning before the world was ever created. Certainly long before Israel was ever created. You understand what I just said? Before they came into being. as the vessel God chose in which to put his testimony. Even the Ark of the Covenant was a type of Israel in that it was the Ark of the Testimony. And in the beginning, before so much disobedience and the Ark being carried away and all of that, it was a threefold testimony that was laid up in the ark. Now we're not going there, but it was. Israel has always been the place, the ch chosen of God. Yes, they were chosen of God for his testimony. They were first, well, just in a general overview. They were the testimony of the lamb and the blood of the lamb. They were, twist, they were the testimony of the mountain of God, the real mountain being Mount Zion. They were a testimony of that mountain at Sinai because Sinai was a testimony of that mountain, but not that mountain itself. And really, Zion is a spiritual reality and in the heart of God always has been. And he used Zion upon which the temple was built in, in those mountains there uh, where Abraham offered Isaac. And it was called Zion. But if you read the scripture, you'll see that actually both Jerusalem and Zion has always been a spiritual reality connected to a spiritual people in the heart and mind of God. It has always been the city of the king who is Christ himself, and Zion has always been the place of his supreme revealing and, 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 uh, uh, and supremacy. It has always been the high thought of God concerning his people. Well, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, the high calling of God is the revealing of his son in you to the extreme exaltation and supremacy of that son himself. Back to my thought, the testimony. So they were the testimony of that. And then they were the testimony of the house of God, the tabernacle itself. They were the testimony of the, of the priest, the high priest. But the order of Aaron is not the fulfillment of our salvation, is it? They were the testimony of the prophet. But the prophets of Israel all fell short of the prophet who is the living word of God himself. Testimony of the king. Peter stands and says to a quotation in the Psalms when Peter was presenting Christ resurrected, Peter said, not about David were these things written. His sepulcher is with us until this day. But the Son, and he preached Christ as that fulfillment. Hun, Christ is the fulfillment of the whole testimony of God. From Genesis throughout, <laughs> throughout the whole time of God giving testimony before the coming of his son as the fulfillment of it all. Paul says 
It all started before the foundation of the world. It didn't start after the testimony. It started before the testimony. It was determined until its end, until its completeness and its ongoing eternal reality. It was confirmed all of that before the testimony was ever given. And it had to because else what would the testimony be about? And I have said, and many of us have said, and it is true, it is true to a, to a degree, I mean it is true, that the testimony is of that that was yet to come. And that, that's a true statement, but it is not the truth itself. Because the testimony, well look, Abraham Jesus said, saw my day. You know how that went with the Jews. They got upset and was ready to kill him then because he made himself greater than our father Abraham. And Jesus simply said to them, well, before Abraham was, I am. So you see, honey, and that goes with Israel, that goes with everything. That's what I've been saying all this time here. It goes for everything. So actually the testimony, yes, one that was yet to come, well, yeah, that's a true statement. But hun, the testimony was of a work not only not only conceived of God and, and promised of God and planned and purposed of God, it was a testimony finished of God before the world was ever created. The whole work of God. See, we can't get our little finite minds around that because we want to see God in linear, linear time. We want, we want eternity to be a long, 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 long time when eternity is just no time at all. No time. And that's exactly what the feasts were talking about. And that's what Israel was speaking of. That's why all of these things were centered around the Sabbath. Every, test, every feast was a Sabbath. Every one of them. And, and finally, there was that great eighth day Sabbath. And everything was summed up in it. Everything of the testimony was of a testimony of that one day, which is summed up in Christ and is an eternal day. So you could just go around and around on this. But my point is that the testimony of the Scripture was not just of something that wasn't yet come. It had not yet been made manifest to man. It was still part of the hidden wisdom of God that had not yet been revealed. But it was a finished work. A full and complete salvation. Else, what was the tabernacle a pattern of? Do you think that Christ was built according to the pattern of the tabernacle or the pattern of the tabernacle was according to Christ? And it wasn't according to Christ what he would be, it was according to Christ who he was. Not yet made manifest because the testimony came before the manifestation. The testimony came, you understand? Before the mystery that was hidden was made manifest the testimony came. But hon, the mystery came. The mystery existed in the heart of God. The hidden wisdom, the hidden purpose, the hidden plan, the finished work. Was before a testimony was ever given. That's what makes the testimony significant. That's why the testimony has such a divine order to it. 
That's why the testimony even speaks of something spiritual. If it wasn't the testimony of something already completed of God, it would have no significance at all and it would have no order to it. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? I don't want to confuse you. But that which came, that which came according to the testimony existed before the testimony. To all of that stuff, Christ could say, before Abraham was, I am. Now, hon, I may still be summing up last Wednesday's lesson in saying this. Because what I want you to see is that that I am is in you right now. The I am before Abraham was is in you right now. The salvation of God given before Adam was ever created is in you right now. We say plan and purpose as though it were something that yet has to be brought to its end. And people believe that the plan of God, yes, it's true, it's real, it's so forth. Now, we're, how are we going to make it work? Or oh, the plan of God is this, the plan of God is that, and one day it'll all be complete. It started out complete. Yeah, our natural mind just, I know, just goes into a short circuit. Because that's the way the natural understanding is. That's the reason God reveals our salvation. Because the natural mind can't understand it. But does God reveal a bunch of things to us? Does he give us a book of instructions and say, here is the how-to. Now this is all true. Here's how to make it work. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we seem to believe that the Bible is. Everything is true. Everything is of God. See, we're we don't even realize the greatness of God. We don't realize the significance of I am the beginning and the ending. I am the alpha. That We do not realize that. We violate it every time we think, how do we make this work? How are we going to live this? Don't you see that? You, you bring it down out of heaven into the earth all the time saying, no, that's not what I'm doing. Yes, it's exactly what we do. And it's been done that way by somebody time and time and time again for 2,000 years. I mean, since there's been a church. The all. The all is in you. And that is never to be a statement of fact it must be a revealed reality. It came with Pentecost. That's why Pentecost is in the center. That's why Pentecost is not three feasts like the other two are. No. One feast. One Sabbath. Everything gathered in. Stands in the midst. The fulfillment of Pentecost is the fulfillment of the substance, the reality, the substance of every feast. Because that Christ is in you. The one who is Pentecost is in you. So Paul starts out before the foundation of the world. 
hath blessed us accordingly as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You understand that? From God's point of view, this is true. And once Christ is in you, who has always been God's point of view, once Christ is in you, it is true for you. It is true for you. We mess this up when we try to apply it to individuals. And we see these words like election and chosen and predestination and we try to apply it to man. No, it's not about man. By the grace of God, we become a partaker of that which God predestined in and of and by and concerning His Son. And he could do that because he already had the Son who was the completion of it. For in the beginning was God and in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, in God, of God and was God. Now John says that one dwells in you. Is that too much for us to hear? Probably in the natural mind it is. Because people have heard it before and they've made movements out of it, but they formed it around man, so they have they have me and you existing back there somewhere. We were all right there too. Some of them are just that stupid to say that. They've got to make it all apply to man. The only way that applies to man is when you and I come to the true baptism of Pentecost. All of that is set forth in the type and shadow, though the natural eye even has a hard time of seeing it, but it's there and certainly in the fulfillment where the natural eye can't see it at all. But Paul brought it out. Don't you understand that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, well, how do you think you got there except by the work of the Spirit of Jesus Christ? Do you not understand that that's the same baptism that John said, He will not baptize you with water? I come doing that. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Do you not understand We were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were also, John, Paul is saying this, therefore, since we were baptized with him into his death, therefore, we were buried with him. We were buried with him by baptism into his death. Why? Oh, I got it so he could get rid of us. Now that wasn't that wasn't the reason. That wasn't the reason. There, there's infinite ways that God could have just gotten rid of us. But that wasn't what it was all about. That, like as Christ was raised up from that death, from all of that, like that he was raised up out from among the dead by the glory of the Father. By the glory of God. Just as that, we should also, we who were baptized to his death, dead with him, buried with him, that we can live by Him. That like as Christ is the resurrection and the life, that like as Christ is the one raised up out from among the dead, even so we should walk in newness of life. How? Like as Christ. Paul goes on in many places to tell us what that's like. It's like that... <laughs> 
Christ is living in me. Paul says it in one statement, one place. I'm crucified with Christ. I live. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And there's a much better translation of that verse. But my point is, he always associating life with the living one living in the believer. The living one living in the believer. Hun, that's the best salvation there is. That's the greatest salvation there is. That's not God figuring up somewhere where I can be one of a whole bunch of people sitting around in the city of God somewhere behind the clouds, uh, you know, as eternal beings uh, looking at God every day because He's there too. No, that's there's a better salvation. There's a better understanding of salvation. There, how about Christ living in you? How about Christ being the true life given of God? How about how about that? How about the life that we have is the fullness? and completeness of the whole thought, mind, intention, and testimony of God. And he lives in me. And in everyone who are born from above. How about that? How about it not be in me? How about not I? Not soulish existence. Not even a soulish existence like Adam in, in total and absolute innocence. But certainly not a soulless existence like Adam in total and complete fear and embarrassment. No, no. Not soulishly. There is not an elimination of the soul, but the soullessness. No. Because the soul was not built for soullessness. It was not built for that kind of knowing, that kind of learning, that kind of living. Self-centered, self-preservation, self, 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 self. No. It was never intended for that. Never, ever intended for that. intended for the spirit of life. For you see, honey, salvation to you and I is not God once again breathing into our nostrils the breath of life and bringing to life, bringing to life a soul. And that's what we think. That's what people think. That's what's being proved. No, no. We receive him who is the living spirit, the life giving, the living spirit, the Lord from heaven, Christ in you. He that liveth, liveth in you. That's what Paul could have said. Not I, but Christ who liveth liveth in me. And I live in that understanding everywhere I am, everywhere I'm found, and at all time that I'm found there. Wherever I may be, whenever I may be there, I am there in this understanding which continually abounds and grows in my heart through the apprehending of Christ who is in me. Oh, hallelujah. Well, I didn't get very far. I'm heading for verse 9 and 10. I've probably got a few minutes. I'll read it. Because he states all of this started from the beginning. Thank you. I've got 10 minutes. That all of this is from the beginning. 
Not just thought up in the beginning. It is out from the beginning. Good Lord, I'm never going to get past this. Uh, 1 John. 1 John. That which was from the beginning. Which we heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon our hands have handled the word of life. And then he goes on. That which was from the beginning. That's in his first epistle. It's all out from the beginning. Genesis starting out, in the beginning God. John saying, yes, in the beginning God, in the beginning God was the word of God. I can't I can't explain in words what I'm trying to tell you. But I am trying to tell you that God didn't make things up as he went along. He didn't create a world and say, now, now I wonder what I can do with that. And he didn't create a man and say, huh, now what plans do I have for him? That's not what happened. And he didn't send his son to be fully made manifest as, as the mystery of God made manifest on the cross where no natural eye saw it then and no natural eye can see it now, but having made it manifest, God can now reveal that reality in those in whom that very Christ lives. He didn't make it up as he went along. It was so from the beginning. It is so in the end because with God the beginning and the end are one and that one is revealed in the person of Christ himself for it hath so pleased the Father that it be that way. And these feasts that we're talking about are fulfilled, made real, and become substance in him. So he says, having made known, verse 9 and 10, this is where I was going to start, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation, this is part of what he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and the dispensation there should be written administration, that in the administration of the fullness of times, that administration came into the world on the day of Pentecost. It came into Israel on the day of Pentecost. It came fully into those who received him on the day of Pentecost. The administration of the Spirit of Christ versus the administration of the law which was a testimony of the administration of the fullness of times. Verse the administration of the times. The times given of God to Israel, the feast themselves. Versus the administration of the fullness of the times, which is the fulfillment of all things in Christ. The administration of the Spirit started with the day of Pentecost. It started with Christ living in those who received Him. that he might gather together in one all things. 
that he might gather together in one. And that word has built into it a meaning of defining and bringing into comprehension. That he might gather up in the comprehension of one. That he might gather up in the, in the understanding of one. That he might gather up in the revealing of one. That all things may come to be comprehended and understood in the one. That's what this is. An administration for the comprehension of all things in the one. A gathering up of the all things. I talked to you a while ago. A gathering up of the all in the all himself. A gathering up the whole of the whole in he who is the completement of the whole himself. A gathering up of all things in one, even in Christ. He didn't just leave it as in one. He named the one. Both that which is in heaven, that which is in earth, that which was be before the earth. That, <laughs> come on, hon, before the foundation of the world. The whole thing. Do you understand now? Can we understand this without making it man-centered and going into all kind of ungodly perversions and ending up trying to make ourselves God? Can we understand what happened on the day of Pentecost? This Spirit came. This Spirit is still alive. He's still working. He's still in those who are born again. And He is still unfolding the fullness. Still unfolding the fullness. Still gathering up in the comprehension of one all things. Where? In those in whom he is dwelling. Those who will have a heart to know him. Even in him is the last two words in that verse 9. Even, or verse 10. Even in him, and the first two words after that is, in whom also we have. My Lord and my God. Now, that brings us into it. If we will be partakers of it. Those having no inheritance but that which is in him. Who, in whom dwelleth all the fullness. Well, we're not going to talk about that just now. I want us to go ahead and look at that because there's some things we need to understand concerning our redemption. And that's where I was headed. In fact, I brought another manual over here thinking that I may have to read out of it, but we didn't get anywhere close to it. This is the manual called The Person of the New Test of the New Covenant. The Person of the New Covenant. It has a section in it on the seven seals upon the scroll, upon the book. Ah, uh, hallelujah. Has to do with the redemption of the purchased possession that is in verse 14 of this very reading that we're doing and I wanted to get to that because it's all about the allness and the one who is all dwelling in you it's all about that it's about the inheritance in his saints our redemption is about that Darling, let me close by simply saying to those who seem to be totally deaf to the hearing of it, and I trust that that's not all that I'm speaking to, and I know that for a fact. Many of you are hearers. I mean true hearers. He that hath an ear, let him hear. But to others who do not seem to have the finished work, full, complete, 
finished work that is in you is ongoing but only in that the Spirit of God is unfolding in the revealing of Christ the reality of it. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There is a work of the Spirit going on, hon, showing you the salvation of the Lord that is in you that came with the Feast of Pentecost. It's like the Lord who gave the feasts of the Lord to Israel took them back unto himself. Fulfill them is the substance of them and he now dwells in you, the believer. All right, our time's up. May the Lord richly bless you. We will continue with this as the Lord allows. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let me know. I'd be happy to hear the questions. I'd be happy to talk with you about it. A lot of times you send me an email and, and, and uh, if you're where I can, uh, I'll, I'll call you back and, and talk with you. Uh, but you can call us, email us in any way. That's the same with any of the speakers here. But uh, if you have questions concerning what we're looking at here in this class, hey, let me know. May the Lord bless you. Amen.